Welcome back, everyone. We're uh, we're on a roll here. This is yet another episode of all the cars I've owned. Now we've talked about a lot of vehicles, um, most of them Nissans, and believe me, we're not done with the Nissans. Um, my first car was an '87 Volkswagen GTI. Then I went to a '97 Mazda 626, and a 1970 Pontiac Tempest. A 1987 Nissan D21 pickup truck. A 1987 Nissan Pathfinder. A 2004, a 2000, sorry, 1999 Nissan Sentra, followed by a 2004 Nissan Frontier. Then a 1989 Nissan Maxima as kind of a kick around car. And now we're on to car number nine. If you've ever seen the movie Heroes, especially the first season of Heroes, there was one vehicle that was such a blatant product placement. It was, it was in your face product placement and it was so random. It's when, um, I believe his name was actually Hero, when he says, I have to rent a Nissan Versa the dream or the cartoon told me to or something like that well you know that was uh that that show was released right around the time the nissan versa was released in north america also known as the nissan tita overseas and guess who the first adopters were for those nissan versas in my area i was one of them uh I, that was the first time I ever bought a brand new car, and, um, and boy howdy, <laughs> that was an interesting car. Um, so, and you're expecting me to sit here and trash the Nissan Versa like everybody else is doing these days, because it's so fun to kick the underdog. But I'm here to tell you that that car actually wasn't that bad. Now. I am a little biased. I bought the car new because I wanted it. And for me, it was the right car at the right time in my life. So I had a Nissan uh, Frontier at the time, and I started my new job, the job that I still have to this day. And I was doing a lot of driving for this job. And the Nissan Frontier just wasn't practical for me. Um, I had to carry a lot of equipment. Um, in an enclosed vehicle where there was no rain or anything. The Frontier, um, if I had added a cap to it and I thought about doing that, I would have solved that problem. But it was very fuel inefficient um, for the amount of driving I was doing. It just couldn't, I was, pump, I was pouring gas into this thing. 20 miles per gallon, 19 miles per gallon, and I was driving a lot. And I didn't make a lot of money at the time either. So, what I ended up doing was, I, I decided, you know what, I'm going to get myself a small, oh, and the, and the pickup was terrible in snow, it was two-wheel drive, so to make it perform in the snow, I'd have to load the back up with weight, and it was just like, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. So, I, uh, I traded that, that truck in on a, um, a Nissan Versa, on purpose, because I wanted one. I actually saw the, the, the promotional materials. I got a brochure, and I really liked what I saw. It was a, a, com, a subcompact hatchback, very roomy inside. I, I sat in one, test drove it. It was very roomy. It was comfortable. Um, and it felt pretty well put together, and uh, it had a lot of features for the money. It was, it was a very well-equipped car. Um, so I went to the dealer. I was actually, I, what I really wanted was, they had one with a six, or I think it was a, I think it was a six-speed manual. Um, it came in, um, uh, I think it was called Blue Onyx. It was a very, like a dark blue with beige interior. That was the one I wanted, and they didn't have one, and they couldn't find me one. So I looked at another one. It was a CBT model. It was a uh, Nissan Versa X, uh, SL with um, charcoal interior cloth. And it was magnetic gray, which was kind of like a, a pleasant, you know, like a darker gray. 
um, alloy wheels. Um, it had a lot of options. It wasn't the tech package, so it didn't have the, uh, the, the keyless ignition or the sunroof, but it did have um, the 6 CD in dash CD changer with aux jack. Um, it was a CBT transmission equipped uh, model with. Um, what else did you get with the SL? Power windows, power door locks, keyless remote uh, entry. Um, it, oh, what else did it have? Of course, air conditioning and a few other bits and, you know, just, just basic stuff for what you would get, you know, in a car back then. Um, but anyway, so I, uh, I bought that brand new. I was one of the first people in my area to have one. Um, I hadn't seen one on the road yet. I hadn't seen a single one. Not one Versa. And uh, I, I felt like I was kind of a trendsetter. Uh, the car, you know, it looks... I, I like the way it looked. I thought it was well designed. The first generation hatchback was a nice looking car, in my opinion. I still think it looks kind of... It does look kind of cheap, but it does... In, it Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, you know. Um... So that was uh, that was a big deal for me. It was my first brand new car, which is never a good decision, by the way. Um, don't buy them new; buy them used. I've learned from my mistakes, and, at least in that regard. But um, so anyway, the experience of owning a brand new Versa was actually kind of interesting because a lot of people hadn't seen them either. And you go to a gas station, right, and People would, 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 would run over and ask you questions about it. How much does, how is the gas mileage? Now this was 2007. I, I didn't, I forgot to mention that in 07, gas prices had eclipsed four bucks a gallon. And it was like, things were getting rough. And, and, and there was no end in sight. There was, there were news articles every day saying that $10 a gallon gas was on the way and oh my God, it was an apocalypse. That's why I bought the Versa, really, because I knew that the gas mileage would be pretty good. And it wasn't terrible. Uh, when the car was brand new, I got about 27 to 28 miles per gallon. As it broke in, it, it approached 30 to 31 miles per gallon, uh, as, as cars do. and They don't tell you this when you buy them. So when you get terrible gas mileage coming off this, you know, the, the showroom floor, well, that's why. Things got to break in, you know? But I got stopped a lot in gas stations by, by looky-loos and, you know, what is that? Is it a hybrid? That was the number one question because it kind of resembled, a little bit resembled the, the Toyota um, uh, Prius. It kind of looks like a Prius and everyone wanted to know if it was a hybrid and what was the gas mileage. And, and, I, and I, I, you know, I, I got used to that for a while and it, it died off very quickly, but... Um, the Versa wasn't the penalty box that people know of it know know it as now. Um, so basic specs it had um, so Nissan for some reason put rear drums on this car because they're cheaper. So it had front disc rear drum uh, brakes. It had the 1.8 MR18DE motor, and it had one of Nissan's earliest uh, CVTs for a compact car. And um, the experience of driving a CVT, I, you know, I didn't really hate it. I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it. I was coming off of a Nissan Frontier, which had a very rough shifting four-speed automatic, and it really was rough. And it wasn't broken, it just was built that way. And having a Versa that just didn't, you couldn't feel it shift. It was like, what you would do is you would, you would step on the accelerator, and you would just hold the pedal down. That was the trick to driving a CVT. You just press it and you hold it in position. The transmission does all the work. And, and that was what took a little bit of getting used to. You just, just press it down gingerly and you don't jump on it, but you press it down and eventually the CVT will catch up to you. And if you need to go faster, you do this, you know, press it down a little harder and whatever. It was a, it was a technique to getting them to run you know, you eventually get used to that. They call it the rubber band effect. <laughs> uh, it's like you're winding up a rubber band. Um, 
the engine, um, I never had any issues with the engine. It was just, you know, it was a, oh, I did. Oh, I'm sorry, I did. So the engine started out very quiet on this car, and as it got higher in miles, like we're almost to the to the point where I got rid of it. So I had this car from, it had nine miles on it, and I got rid of it with about 59 and change, just, just before the warranty went out. And the engine was starting to wrap a little bit, um, although I didn't realize it until I, I listened to a few other video clips on YouTube later on, and I realized that the engine was like really close to its end of life. <laughs> It wasn't wrapping, it wasn't a rod knock, but it was, um, it had a lot of piston slap. Um, that's what was going on. It had a lot of piston slap, and um, that's ultimately why I got rid of it. But I did keep the car for about three years. Um, I don't know, two years. But I managed to put um, just about 60,000 miles on it in those two years. Crazy. <laughs> Two and a half years. Two and a half years. That's sixty thousand miles. Um, so I had a few warranty claims on this one. Um, so number one, the AC compressor, which was a known issue with these cars, uh, started making a lot of noise um, very early on, probably under twenty thousand miles. You turn the AC on, and it sounded like a diesel engine. So I brought it into the dealership. And they said, uh, yeah, um, in order for us to, to make that repair, we have to diagnose it first, which means that we have to evacuate and recharge the system. And I had to pay for that. And I'm like, that doesn't sound right. It's a warranty claim. I shouldn't have to pay anything. I argued with the guy, and he wouldn't let up on me. So I paid, regretfully paid the $130 to have them evacuate and recharge the system, and, I, and it didn't fix it. So they actually did reimburse me that $130 fee, and then they put in a new compressor, and all was well for a little while. Then it started doing it again. Meh, anyway. The, um, never had any transmission issues, but I did have this car serviced faithfully. So, um, you know, I had the transmission service done at one point, which was $500. For a CVT, and the only people that could do it at the time was Nissan because nobody serviced CVTs. So I had that done. That was a waste of money. Um, I had the brake fluid changed. I had the oil changed. I mean, I took really good care of this car. I faithfully rotated the tires. Um, but what really got me to get rid of this vehicle was its performance in the snow. The car was so lightweight. It had an all aluminum engine and a lightweight CVT transmission. So it weighed nothing. And, there, and more importantly, there was no weight where it counted over the front wheels. So I was, at the time, I lived in a, in a fairly mountainous area. And I put snow tires on this thing. And it, um, it just, even with snow tires, the thing was, it, I was getting stuck everywhere. And it was getting very old very fast. There's one little flaw with the CVT transmission that nobody's talking about. And that is if you live in, a, in an area where there's snow and ice, and you're driving along, and then you, re you start slipping, and then you try to get yourself out of that situation. Well, here's what happens. In order for a CVT to change gears, it has to be in motion. And what will happen is this. So you're driving along and the wheels start to slip. And then the engine, for whatever reason, let's say you don't react fast enough, and your RPMs race up to whatever, and you're in its highest gear. You let off the accelerator, you press the brake to stop the wheels from moving. You put the car in reverse or whatever. The car doesn't move. You put it in forward. The car, the wheels don't even turn. You've basically locked up the CVT transmission. Now, what happens is they go into a, I, I, as far as I understand this, it's a safety feature for the transmission, not necessarily for the driver. It doesn't know what to do with itself. Because you can't get the wheels moving again and su at such a high gear, it's stuck, the transmission can't downshift. So you're stuck. You're, you, you just locked up the drivetrain. Um, but if you let the car sit long enough, 
I think it actually automatically and slowly somehow it it, it, it changes its gear ratio. I don't know how that works, but um, so you have to let the car sit for like 10, 15 minutes, and then it'll let you move. That was da that was a dangerous thing because in New England or any snowy region, you can rock yourself out of a jam. You know, forward, reverse, forward, reverse. The CBT doesn't let you do that. It doesn't shift fast enough into reverse or into forward. There's a slight delay in those CBTs. When you put it in reverse, it would delay into engagement. And that can be dangerous, especially on some roads where there's a lot of traffic and other vehicles might have better traction than you, and there's a recipe for, for a disaster. After buying this car, I got a lot of J.D. Power uh, surveys and J.D. Power, Consumer Reports, all these magazines and publications were just bombarding me because I was a very, I was an early adopter of a new model, so they wanted all that data as fast as they could get it. And one of the things, I don't know if they do this anymore, but back then, they would give you a dollar, like a dollar bill in the envelope with the survey and uh, it was yours to keep and you fill out the survey and send it back. I thought that was interesting. I think I got a nickel one time. I, they sent me a survey and, and there was a nickel in there. That was, that was kind of, I forget who that was, but I know that JD Power was like two bucks. It was actually pretty good. So another problem I had with that car was the uh, six disc CD changer. I hadn't yet purchased an iPad and smartphones weren't a thing in 2007 yet. But CDs were still popular, so I had my uh, six-disc CD changer, which um, I think after about a year and a half, it jammed up. Um, it just and, and that video, by the way, is still on my channel and how I fixed it. Um, I had to take the whole unit completely apart and put some lubrication in a few spots and uh, unjam the mechanism, and it was fine ever since. I thought that was interesting. Another thing about this car is I had a lot of flat tires. I got a lot of flat tires. In fact, in my entire driving career, um, I think 80% to 90% 90, 90 of my flat tires were in that damn Versa. Um, strangest thing, I just kept getting flat tires, like nails and stuff like that. Weird. But... Uh, now, you know, that car, other than as it, as it aged, it did start showing some age. Like, for example, um, around the time it had about 50,000 miles on it, the strut, the front strut bearings were starting to fail. And what would happen is in the morning, you would, you would turn the wheel to get out of a spot, out of a parking space, and you'd hear a loud thunk or a bang uh, coming from the strut tower area. That was uh, that was that was cute. Um, oh, what else did it do? Yeah, there was when it was cold, you would get a lot of um, piston slap noise until it warmed up. That was nice. Oh, and another flaw that the Versa had was the fuel pump, either the fuel pump or the fuel pump relay, was uh, trouble problematic as they aged. And it would take a lot, and it would take a long time for it to start. Like you'd press, you, actually, you had to crank it. It was a key. You turn the key, and it wouldn't start like for one or two attempts, and then it would start. That happened um, starting at about forty thousand miles, give or take. And it happened only a few times, but there was a known issue with those. If it could, if you could duplicate it at the dealer, they would replace, I believe, a fuel pump relay. Um, so yeah, I mean, it wasn't a great car. I paid $18,000 for this thing brand new uh, in 2000, and, and uh, I bought it on January 20th or so, 2007. So the car was built in December of 06. It was one of the first ones in, 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 uh, in this area to be sold. But um, it was uh, my first new car, you know. And I love the car. I, you know, the funny thing is everybody shits on them, but I liked mine. I thought it was fairly comfortable. The seats had memory foam in them, and, and they were fairly big for the car, you know. It, they, they were just, they were nice, very nice seats. I drove that car to Pennsylvania once, 
um, central, south central Pennsylvania, Chambersburg, at least once. And I, you know, it, it wasn't the best ride I'd ever had, but <laughs> it wasn't the worst. Um, but yeah, that was, I kind of missed that car because it just, I don't know. It was it was it was a nice feeling owning a brand new car, no matter what it was. It could have been a Hyundai Accent, but it was new. I was I was the first owner, you know. All I had to do was do the maintenance and not have to repair it. But uh, traded that thing in. The main reason I got rid of that car wasn't the fact that it was deteriorating before my eyes, but it was actually because. Um, yeah, it was because it just didn't do well enough in snow, and I was I was constantly getting stuck, um, and it was just it wasn't working out for me. One uh, one little detail I didn't mention: um, this car actually, when it was brand new, um, I nearly totaled it. <laughs> Not really totaled it, but so I got into a fender bender, but it was an expensive one. I tell you that. So I'm driving through, it was my fault, I made a mistake in an intersection, I'll just leave it at that. And um, I got hit, or I hit, I, I caused the accident. I hit a 1991 Honda Civic, it was a, an offset, almost head on, it was slightly offset, but head on at low speed. It was a very low speed accident. Um, the girl I hit, uh, her car broke, I broke it, broke a headlight. That was it. There was no other damage to the car, broke a headlight. Probably a hundred bucks worth of damage. My car, my brand new 5,000 mile Nissan Versa, had $5,000 worth of damage. Five grand is what it cost to fix that stupid car. No damage to the fenders. There was no fender damage at all. No paint damage to the fenders or the hood. The front bumper, the, the bumper cover, the insulator behind it, the bumper frame behind that, all damaged, all destroyed. And the, um, the grill was damaged. The headlights were damaged because they, the, the mounts cracked off of them. Um, the, uh, the bumper support, the bumper supports that are part of the unibody, the, the part of the unibody structure of the front end of the car were both bent a little bit. Um, yeah, it was, uh, basically the frame rails were bent. And I believe that's what that technically is called. That's called the, fr yeah, those are the frame rails and the bumper mounting flanges are on the end of them. Both of them were bent and had to be straightened. That was exciting. <laughs> that poor car. Um, yeah, I had 5,000 miles. I had, I had it for less than three months. Actually, it happened in March. I bought it in January, so yeah. January, February, March. Yep, yeah, March. Uh, and um, I drove the car home, but it kind of ran a little uh, crooked. The car never ran right since, though. It never drove the right way. It never drove right since. Ever since that accident, it was always something a little off with it. Um, I brought it to one of the best auto body shops in the area. They fixed it with all factory parts. My insurance company paid the bill. I paid a deductible. And, um, and that was that. But it, uh, yeah, nearly... Uh, just ruined it for me, you know. Now the car has been fixed and hit, and when you when you when a car is in an when an act when you have a car that's in an accident, um, it always lowers the value um, because it gets reported to Carfax. People look at that when they go to buy the car and used. When you sell it, they looked at they, they're looking at it and they're looking at a Carfax that says it had an accident. Oh, I don't know about you, but I'd rather buy a car that has no accident history. Um, but I know not all accidents are reported to Carfax, so there's that. But if you know there's an accident on the record, and it's obvious because you could tell it never it never lined up perfectly ever after that. Um, 
it just kind of makes it less desirable. So when I traded that car in, I definitely got hit uh, on that. Um, they, they dinged the, uh, the value on that one. Um, I mean, it wasn't like... <laughs> and I actually, and after they asked me about the accident, because they pulled the car facts, I showed them the report of all the parts that were replaced and everything, I didn't know. But um, anyway, 90, uh, the 2007 Nissan Versa. It, uh, it wasn't as bad of a car as they make it out to be, um, but it was definitely poorly built. Um, I, I, I can I can I can def I can testify to that. It, it it's not a car that had a long service life ahead of it. I'll tell you that much. Now I was also part of the uh, Nissan Versa forums at the time, and um, so I, I regularly kept in touch with other Versa owners. We were all early adopters, first first model year early adopters, and. Um, some of the things that those cars were known for were actually scary as hell. Uh, strut tower bearings, which I started experiencing on mine. Transmission failures were fairly regular on those. Um, but complete engine failures were a known issue too. Um, largely due to piston slap and other issues. But the engines were not known for, for longevity in those, in those cars. But... Um, Catalytic converter failures were a regular issue, um, and as they are, I believe, in all Nissan products. Fuel pumps. Yeah, they, they were not a they were not a well made car in hindsight. Well, thank you for watching. If you happen to have a 2007 Nissan Versa and would like to share your stories, post them in the comments. I'd love to hear back. Uh, from other people that have owned those cars later in their in their useful lives. I wish I had the VIN number. I don't have it anymore. I wish I had the VIN number so I could look up to see if it was still out there, but I uh, I can't seem to get that information from my insurance company, or I don't have the paperwork anymore. But it's one of those cars I'd like to I'd like to follow up on, see how it's doing, but probably not going to happen. Well, until then, guys, we're gonna. Put this one in the bag.